Good evening. Welcome to Lightning Talks presented by the Seattle Aquarium. I'm Jim Wharton. Uh, I, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning here at the Aquarium. Now, the Seattle Aquarium is located on the shores of Puget Sound in the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people who have stewarded these lands and waters for generations and continue to do so today. Now, as June as home to both Juneteenth and Pride, it's a fitting time to remember that environmental benefits and burdens are not equally distributed and will only have conservation success by incorporating the diverse work and perspectives of all people. Now, diversity makes any system, whether it's an ecosystem, a workplace, or a community, uh, healthier, more resilient, and more interesting. Now, June is also Orca Action Month, and that's why this latest edition of uh, of Lightning Talks is dedicated to one of the most iconic and charismatic populations in the Pacific Northwest. Now we've got five great speakers and they're gonna give us perspectives from both the endangered Southern resident population and our thriving population of transient or bigs killer whales. Now, if you've never been to a Lightning Talks before, this is what you have in store. Five speakers have five minutes each to share one big idea and not one second more. They will get a warning at one minute and another at 30 seconds, and then finally at time. Now we don't have a hook long enough to reach them, so if they go over tonight, they'll get. Now we wanna make sure that we keep things moving tonight so we won't be stopping for questions in between each speaker, but we do have an amazing Q&A uh, session that's planned for the end of the evening, so please stick around for that. If you have any questions or comments for our speakers, please put those into the chat. And who knows, you might even see one of your comments or questions make it onto the screen. So don't be shy about what you'd like to share. Now, if you enjoy programs like this and would like to see more, then please consider a donation to the Seattle Aquarium. Now, when you donate to the aquarium, you're joining us in our mission of inspiring conservation of our marine environment. We have a tremendous slate of speakers this evening, as we always do. And as I always do, I'm going to skip reading them to you because I'm really excited to get started. And so what I'm going to do is jump right to our first speaker. And so please allow me to welcome to the virtual stage, Jenny Atkinson. Jenny is from the Whale Museum, and she'll be telling us a little bit more about the challenges that are facing our Southern residents and the power of a name. Jenny, are you ready to get us kicked off tonight? I'm ready, Jim. Thanks for the invitation. I am so excited to be with the Seattle Aquarium for a lightning talk tonight. All right, well, we're excited to have you and the floor is yours. Hi everyone, get ready. I might get the bolt, but I am going to attempt to cover in five minutes what I could easily talk about all day, the Southern resident orcas and the power of names. Their story is one that is important to all of us. It's connected to all of us. Wherever we live, all ecosystems connect. And when an ecosystem is unhealthy, we are all at risk. Our orcas are at risk. So let's take a quick dive into the orcas world to get our bearings. Orcas are mammals like us. They are huge and can be very long lived, up to a hundred years. Their lifespan is similar to ours. They are individually identifiable on site, typically by the dorsal fin and saddle patch. Although if you look closely, you will see that wherever black meets white on a whale, it is unique to that orca. Orcas are a joy to watch. They can be dynamic in their behaviors, but they can also be very calming. It is simply lovely to watch a group resting, slowly moving and surfacing to breathe. There are more than 50,000 orcas on the globe. They are found in every ocean, but not every orca is alike. There are a variety of ecotypes, which has to do with what they eat and how they live. For example, some or orcas are spray specialists, some eat fish, others eat marine mammals. There are three ecotypes in the Pacific Northwest, offshore, transient or bigs, and residents. Let's look closer at our endangered fish eating population known as the Southern Resident Community of Orcas. A closed society, they only breed within their community, have a common language and shared culture. This research is what led to listing this population as endangered in both the United States and Canada. There are three pods, J, K and L, with only 75 members remaining. They have been individually identified. 
Each has a scientific designation or alphanumeric from the Center for Whale Research. They have a nickname given to them from the Whale Museum's Org Adoption Program. Southern residents are one big family, so we know who they are related to. They are matriarchal and tend to stay with their moms all of their lives. So most likely, mom is in charge. Their range is extensive, foraging from Southeast Alaska to California and throughout the Salish Sea. They have a common language which has three dialects. Sound is critical. They need quieter waters to communicate and echolocate. This is J-Pod. <coughs> Current threats facing these urban whales are significant and include shortage of salmon, especially Chinook, vessel disturbance, sound presence and emissions, and toxic waters. Historic reasons, most notably the capture era, led to their decline. While captures of the southern residents are no longer occurring, that era was devastating. Even though captures had ended in the United States, a capture of L-pod whales was proposed in Canada in 1983. People got the idea to name the orcas in hopes of inspiring others to help stop the capture. It worked. They are no longer just a beautiful group of orcas. They are now a beautiful group of individuals. We know them by name. Names are powerful connectors. The Whale Museum continues to give the orcas names and share their stories. You can even help name baby L125 right now by voting on our website. Both the United States and Canada have recovery plans. Those agencies and many others are conducting research and implementing actions to aid the orcas in their recovery, but they are still struggling and need our help. You can help too. No matter where you live, all ecosystems connect. It's one planet, our shared home. Lighten your carbon footprint, consume less, conserve more, help clean waterways, plant trees, restore shoreline habitat, and above all else, share what you've learned and be well wise. Thank you so much for listening. I know that was a lot, but trust me, there is so much more we could talk about and will tonight. I hope this gives you some context and connection to these magnificent orcas. Back to you, Jim. Well, thank you, Jenny. That was great and nowhere near five minutes, which I know you were worried about. So, you know, the naming thing is really important to us here at the aquarium too. We, we do a lot of work with empathy. And what one of the things that we always say is when you give an animal a name, you give it a narrative without much more effort. And so uh, it seems like the naming of the orcas has been a really important part of the effort to recover their, their populations. Definitely. And I love what you said at the top. It is about diversity. There's room for all of us and we need to include all of us. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. Jenny's gonna be back at the end of the program. So if you have questions for her, if they pop up during the course of the night, then please do put those into the chat because that's the first place we're gonna go for the questions during that Q&A. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Now our next speaker is Jasmine Pratt. Jasmine is with NOAA Fisheries, and she's also a former Seattle Aquarium volunteer. Now, Jasmine's going to tell us a little bit about one of the most important prey items that are uh, just critical to the diet of our southern resident killer whales and something that's causing them more than a little bit of a hassle. So, Jasmine, are you ready to, to take us out next? I'm ready. Thanks so much, Jim. All right. The floor is yours. All right, Jenny was super fast, so now I might be alone with my uh, lightning bolt, but I'm gonna do my best to get through this um, big topic really fast that I could talk about all day, um, which is what does driving your car have to do with orcas? So to set the stage for this research, I'm going to talk about urban streams. Um, and in the 1990s, Seattle funded a lot of restoration uh, projects for urban streams. And one of the goals of this work was really to increase spawning habitat for Pacific salmon. And after this work had been completed, of course, we were really interested to see whether the salmon would come and utilize this new habitat. Um, and we were happy that they did. However, um, some of the salmon were not looking healthy. So this is an example of a video of a not healthy looking coho. And in fact, um, salmon were returning to these urban streams, trying to use this new habitat to spawn, but something was killing them before they were able to spawn. So researchers were finding them full of eggs. And of course, this is very disappointing after all this effort had gone into increasing the habitat and the salmon populations in the Puget Sound area. 
So this became um, somewhat of a murder mystery. What is killing coho salmon? And uh, researchers from my lab um, began to address this work um, several years ago. And the first breakthrough of this work was really relating these salmon mortality events to urban stormwater runoff. This was done over a multi-year study, um, looking at several different water quality parameters that ultimate, ult ultimately linked urban stormwater runoff to these mortality events. Um, and since we're talking about orcas today, I also wanna highlight that we've looked at how different species of salmon are impacted by stormwater runoff in the Puget Sound. And we found that coho are particularly sensitive. Chum salmon are um, very impressively resilient, but we've also looked at um, some preliminary research spanning even more species, including Chinook, which is a key food source for orcas, and found that steelhead and Chinook are the next most sensitive species of Pacific salmon to stormwater runoff. And my master's research really wanted to more closely understand and quantify um, how uh, sensitive coho are to stormwater runoff. Because as you can imagine, if you look at the video on the right here, um, stormwater is diluted into the Puget Sound into urban streams. So we wanted to understand the sensitivities to those dilutions. And Looking just at this graph, I want you to focus on the green arrow here. Um, so the bottom uh, y-axis is giving you different dilutions of stormwater runoff and comparing that to mortality events on the y. So 2.2% stormwater um, compared to almost 98% clean water um, was the highest concentration of stormwater runoff that coho could tolerate with no mortality events. And again, we're not looking at Pot uh, potential sublethal events, only mortality. So they are incredibly sensitive. Um, starting at 5% stormwater runoff, you start to see consistent mortalities across different storms. So we wanted to expand on this research and understand what was causing this reaction um, in the salmon. And we brought in some chemists and did a lot of research and ultimately linked a specific chemical within tires in common cars as um, the key toxicant that these coho salmon are responding to, 6-PPD quinone. Um, and I will stop it there. Feel free to um, look more into this or I can answer additional questions. Um, but I just wanna end on a highlight of, we've already established that simple mixtures of sand and um, soil are enough to filter out this toxicant. So really encourage everyone to support increased green stormwater infrastructure. In the future, we are working with um, tire manufacturing companies and um, are hopeful that there can be salmon safe tires in the future. And with that, thank you um, to all of the funders of this research. Well, thank you, Jasmine. That was great. You know, I, I was I was hearing you're talking about looking at mortalities, but also there's there's likely to be effects at sublethal sublethal levels, and it just made me think that there we're we're probably even still underestimating the impact on those salmon populations. Right? It could be affecting reproduction. It could be affecting survivorship. Uh, you know, later in life, uh, it's 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 kind of scary, but it's good to good to have some information and now have a path where maybe we could take some steps. Yeah, there is a suite of um, sublethal effects that could be going on. We already have some um, indication of blood parameters that are affected um, at low low levels of um, stormwater. So we don't really understand what the impacts of that could be sublethally yet. I know there was discussion of doing swim tests with the fish and seeing if there's any impacts there. Um, but yeah, we are really still scratching the surface in terms of understanding the the full breadth of potential of impacts that could be occurring at the sublethal level here. Well, thanks, Jasmine. This is really important work, and I really appreciate you coming on to share this. I remember, everybody, Jasmine will be coming back at the end of the evening for the Q&A. So if you have questions about, about this particular topic or another one that Jasmine might be able to answer, please do put those in the chat. Jasmine, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. And now our next speaker, 
uh, will be Jillian, uh, Cam- or excuse me, Jillian Lechner Campbell from Vancouver Island Whale Watch. And Jillian's going to tell us a little bit about sustainable whale watching. Take it away, Jillian. And thank you for having me. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge that I'm speaking you t- to you today from the traditional territory of the Sinaimic First Nation. My name is Jalan Lechner Campbell, and I'm the co-founder of Vancouver Island Whale Watch. And uh, I'm here to talk to you today about sustainable whale watching. Um, my husband and I opened this company in 2018 with the goal of operating the most sustainable whale watching tours in the world. Um, and to that end, um, we've made a number of commitments, but today I'm going to focus on uh, speaking to you about our commitment to completely avoiding the endangered southern resident killer whale population. Um, So a little bit about myself. Um, My background is biology. I studied at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, which is where I'm from. And uh, I've had a number of really cool opportunities to work with whales since then. Um, So in 2015, um, that's where this photo is from. It's with the Alaska Whale Foundation. Uh, That was when I did a sperm whale survey up there for the summer. Uh, The photo in the center is from 2016. It's with Kita Coastal Conservation. Uh, We're a humpback whale organization um, studying the return of humpback whales to the Salish Sea. And then the photo on the right is myself and my husband in 2018 on our very first whale watching tour with Vancouver Island Whale Watch. And so whale watching in the Salish Sea, just to show you where that uh, where that exactly is, the little star here, that's Nanaimo. That's where we depart from on Vancouver Island. Um, The Salish Sea is uh, the waters of the Strait of Georgia, the Canadian Gulf Islands Archipelago, the U.S. San Juan Islands, and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So whales can be found anywhere in this area. There's about 30 whale watching companies in the Salish Sea departing from various points. Um, And it's also not uncommon for whale watchers to cross the border um, to view whales um, in Canada or the U.S. So that happens a lot as well. Um, The types of whales that we see on uh, whale watching tours, a lot more than just these three species, but this is what I'll focus on. On the left, we have Southern Resident Orca. Um, so this is a photo from the Center for Whale Research. Southern Resident Orca are critically endangered. There's only 75 of them left, and they go, come to the Salish Sea for salmon. Salmon make up over 80% of their diet, so that's mostly what they're looking for here. Humpback whales uh, return to the Salish Sea in the summertime, and every year we see more humpback whales on our tours than we did the year before. So they're a growing population, so that is wonderful to see. And on the right, we've got Biggs orca. So Biggs orca are another growing population of orca. They are distinct from the southern resident population. Biggs orca prey on uh, seals and sea lions, so they're eating marine mammals, and that can also make them really exciting to watch. So we've got two thriving populations of whales, the humpback whales and the bigs orca, and then we have this declining population of southern resident killer whales. So scientists have identified three main threats to this population. Uh, So prey availability, that's the big one. They're looking for salmon and salmon stocks in the Salish Sea are declining. So it's getting harder and harder for them to find that salmon that they really need. Bioaccumulation of toxins is another big issue for them. So PCBs and other toxins that make their way into the water, they bioaccumulate up the food chain. And animals at the top of the food chain, like killer whales, actually carry the largest concentration of these toxins in their tissue. Marine noise can actually exacerbate these threats. And that's where we as vessel operators come in. So when these whales are looking for their prey, they're using sound, they echolocate to find their prey. And when they've got a noisy marine environment, it makes it a lot more difficult for them to be successful in finding that prey that is already scarce. So when they're not able to find their prey, of course, they're not able to eat as much. And that means that they're going to lose weight. When they lose weight, they start to metabolize those fat tissues. And that's when those toxins can enter their bloodstream. And that's when it really becomes a problem for them. So these are all really great reasons to not watch this population. Uh, we've been we've made this commitment since we opened in 2018. We've had lots of success not watching this population. We found whales on almost every single tour. Um, and we've been able to focus on healthy, thriving populations of whales instead. Um, So uh, this pledge that we made was actually formalized last fall by five amazing organizations, the NRDC, Friends of the San Juans, Washington Environmental Council, the Seattle Aquarium, and the Whale Trail. They all got together and created this website where you can go as an individual and you can sign the pledge to give these whales space by staying at least 1,000 yards or one kilometer away from them. There are a number of individuals that have already signed this pledge. As of today, Vancouver Island Whale Watch is the only company in the Salish Sea who has signed 
this pledge, the only whale watching company in the Salish Sea. So um, if you do think this is important and you want to go whale watching, please pressure your local tour operators uh, to sign this pledge as well. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, if anyone has any questions, Natalie and Rodrigo are here to uh, answer those questions for you. Thanks again. As she mentioned, her colleagues, Natalie and Rodrigo, will be joining us in the Q&A. So if you have questions about Vancouver Island Whale Watch, sustainable whale watching, or the Give Them Space Pledge, please drop those in the chat and we'll save them for later. And so our next speaker is Aaron Ash from the Oceans Initiative. The Oceans Initiative. That's a little tougher to say than I was expecting. Uh, so she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, sound in the sound and how it's related to orca survival. So Aaron, are you ready? Oh, I, I think you might be muted. Here we go. We're gonna get, that's appropriate for um, talking about sound, I think. Right, it's almost like we planned it. We did, we did, we <laughs> planned this completely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jim, and um, thank you for the opportunity to talk this evening about the work we do at Oceans Initiative. We are a research nonprofit based in the Pacific Northwest, but we also work globally, and I'm really excited to dive in and chat a little bit about some of that work. Sound is incredibly important to whales, dolphins, and other marine wildlife. Light does not transmit very well underwater, but sound propagates extremely well. So this means that whales use sound to find food, stick together and find their way in a very dark ocean. And they probably communicate about a million things that we've yet to discover, including escaping predation as this dolphin is showing us. With the Southern resident killer whales um, that are depicted here, um, they're a wonderful example, really, of how important sound is to marine wildlife in the ocean. As Jenny just shared, they have their own dialect. They communicate about where to find salmon, how to stick together. And um, we will see how, how these families are, are making their way through the ocean. Um, as I mentioned, sound propagates very well underwater, which is great for whale communication. But unfortunately, the noise from boats and ship also, ships also propagates extremely well underwater. And I'm not sure if I wasn't aware of this prior to getting engaged with this topic, but um, around 90% of all of our goods, the goods that we buy are brought to us by ship. And as this shipping noise increases, you can see in the red here, this is just a, um, an example of shipping traffic globally, you can see that the red are the louder, the louder parts of the ocean. So what does this mean for um, Southern resident killer whales? Um, well, for the orcas that live here in the Salish, the busy shipping lanes of the ports of Seattle and Vancouver, we're finding that on a typical day, our research shows that whales are losing about 62% of their opportunities for long range communication. On a busy day, the whales lose 97% of those opportunities to communicate. But this really comes into play with respect to food because they're losing almost a quarter of their opportunities to find the salmon that are quite scarce. And all of this research that we've been working on over the past decade plus prompted us to ask, well, what would happen if the people were quiet? Uh, much as uh, Jillian was just speaking about staying farther away, um, and much of the work we do at Oceans, Initi Oceans Initiative, I'm even messing my own name up, um, is to conduct science to identify quiet areas that we want to keep quiet and noisy areas that need to be made quieter. But how would you do that? Um, for years, there had been talk about an international quiet ocean experiment where everyone would be quiet for a day or some period of time. But it really didn't get, um, we couldn't really figure out how to do that. But then a colleague of ours from Bali shared with us a story of Nepi. And in Bali, um, there's a, a holiday on the Hindu calendar where there is a day of silence. It's on land, of course. But for 24 hours, the airport, the shipping ports, and all the shops are closed. 
even tourists are asked to come off the beach and take some time to be silent. A few years ago, um, our chief scientist, Rob Williams, um, partnered with a university and local nonprofit organization in Bali to put underwater microphones around and measure underwater, underwater noise levels before, during, and after the day of silence. And what we found was that this spiritual practice for humans inadvertently benefited wildlife in the ocean. The studies showed that when boaters and shippers stayed home for 24 hours, noise levels dropped and the sonic world of the ocean came alive. So in, in terms of metrics, there was a 16 fold um, increase in the acoustic space of a whale or a dolphin. And that gives you some indication of how much we're altering the quality of the ocean around the world. So we're also wondering at Oceans Initiative, could we give the orcas maybe not a day of silence, but could we give them an hour? Um, and for one hour, we could listen to the whales sing um, in an ocean that may be as quiet as their ancestors um, were used to. So we are continuing our connection across the globe by working with uh, the Seattle Aquarium to record some of some fish calls of their fish species from the Salish Sea and the Coral Triangle to make a call catalog. And we're working to identify the preferred feeding areas of the Southern resident killer whales here in the Salish Sea. So maybe we could keep those very important feeding areas quieter. And I would, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for the opportunity to share with you some of the work we're doing. Please keep in touch and thank you again. Thank you so much, Erin. I will say you were so close, like, a, <laughs> like an electron's close for that, from the lightning, but well done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love that that story about the day of silence, I think is just so moving and it's really such a great, um, demonstration of what we do on land matters even if we're not even if it doesn't touch the side like our sat the sound that we're creating is having is reaching and touching the the animals and the sound as well yes it's interesting um some of our recent work has shown that we're even able to detect um airplane noise in the ocean which hadn't really been reported before so we're exploring that further this summer that's amazing thank you so much thank if you, you have questions for aaron Put them in the chat. She will be back in just a few minutes. Uh, in fact, in about five minutes. So thank you, Aaron. And actually probably in exactly five minutes because our last speaker this evening will be Deborah Giles or Giles as she prefers. Uh, Giles is from the UW, is doing some work with the UW Center for Conservation Biology and is also with Wild Orca. And Giles, are you ready to bring us home? All right. Well, may, I think you might be muted, so make sure you unmute. I think that was just in honor of the previous talk, which is appreciated. So uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you see my video going? Not yet. Hmm. Let's give it a go again. So see if you're sharing, because I don't see it on the screen yet. Uh, it says I can stop sharing, so I must be sharing. Hmm. Oh, I see something happening. Yeah. Oh, dear. That's uh, OK. Technical difficulty. What was going to be in the video? Well, I'm trying to show uh, share my PowerPoint. Oh, OK. Can you see my PowerPoint? I can see, yes. It looks good. It looks like it's on its way. Here it is. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thank you so much for um, having me be a part of this amazing group and uh, being able to celebrate uh, the Orca Month and the kind of we are, we are family concept here. So my big concept has to do with the fact that we're all family on this planet. So this is uh, our scat detection dog, Eba, Eba the uh, whale dog. You can follow her on Instagram if you'd like to. So everybody loves a pooping whale because if you have a pooping whale, it means that you have a whale that's eating and a whale that's eating enough to, to poop anything out for us to collect. 
uh, when we can collect a scout sample from the southern residents or any other cetacean that occurs in the Salish Sea, we can tell a tremendous amount of information about what's happening with the individual, but also with the population that they come from, and lastly, the ecosystems that they rely on. As mentioned before, the southern resident killer whales were listed in the United States in 2005 with a wide variety of threats, but the three main ones that came to the surface were lack of quality and quantity prey, specifically Chinook salmon, vessel presence and associated noise, and the exposure to, exposure to uh, man-made toxicants. Uh, out of all of those threats, by far the biggest threat is the lack of quality and quantity prey. You can see from these photos that fish used to be massive, uh, 120 plus pounds in some cases. Unfortunately, sh uh, salmon are shrinking and the whales are starving. Uh, with the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology and the, with the help of conservation canines, we utilize uh, highly trained scat detection dogs on the front of our boat to be able to non-invasively collect scat samples. So by using a dog, we can stay really far away from the back end of the animal after the animal, after our dogs are trained on the scat uh, that we're looking for. So right now our dog, Eba, as I mentioned, is uh, very, very well trained on Southern resident fish eating killer whale scat. Um, and we are looking to collect more Biggs killer whale or transient killer whale scat to train her on, as well as all of the baleen whales that occur in the Salish Sea. So we've got uh, um, just a massive number of humpbacks coming here again, uh, minke whales and gray, uh, gray whales. So I wanted to show this film. This is just from yesterday. So this is a momentous occasion for us because it's our very first uh, transient scat sample that we have collected from our vessel. We did this with the help of Michael Weiss, Dr. Michael Weiss from the Center for Well Research, who was on board with us and flying a drone. So here's a quick video of, of a whale pooping in case anybody's excited as uh, even half as excited as I am. Of course, drones are just phenomenal pieces of equipment. So right there, that guy left us a fabulous sample. So that turned out that the family was uh, at this point, five members of the T46Bs. And uh, this is a great picture uh, from a, a local gentleman, Dante Aubert, who took this from Cattle Pass. And this is showing us collecting that sample. It turned out Michael was able to show it was from uh, T46B4. Uh, um, Jenny, you talked about names. So his name is Quiver and, uh, or actually, I don't know if it's a male or a female. Her name uh, is Quiver and she was born in 2013. So in the past, I have been on board with NOAA when we collected another scout sample. You can see that one in, up in the top corner. Uh, that one was made out of mostly hair, about 90% hair and uh, some other goopy stuff holding it together, stellar sea lion hair specifically. Uh, what we collected yesterday was tiny compared to that. So you can see in the beaker after we scoop, that's what it looked like. And then when we got it into the tubes, it spun down to just over about a mil and a half. So uh, I'm gonna probably go over. I thought I was gonna be able to do this, but uh, just showing this is what Eva works for. Just to get to play with her toy a little bit. Good girl. I'll end it there so I maybe don't get the lightning bolt. Scouts can tell us a tremendous amount about the individual and the population that they came from. Uh, this list here is just uh, just kind of probably scratching the surface. The newest analysis that's being done in our lab with uh, Dr. Sam Wasser's grad student, Will Sano, is looking at gut microbiome. So that's gonna be very exciting to see what, what that tells us. Here's some pictures of uh, beautiful, healthy, fat, massive samples, and we, we just don't see those so much anymore. Uh, almost to the last, oh, I'm gonna get the lightning bolt. We're not just losing individuals, we're losing a whole population when we lose individuals. The fabric of the population completely changes with the loss. If my slide is still showing, these are our funders. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Giles. And thank you for going over really, because it's just not quite lightning talks unless somebody goes over. Although I, I was gonna say, 
there was no way I was giving the lightning bolt to Eva. So if you would have <laughs> stuck on that slide, you would have been able to sail through to the home. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we're about to jump into our Q&A. So Giles is not going to go anywhere. She's going to stay on the screen and we're going to welcome everybody back to the screen. And we're going to welcome Natalie, who's joining us from Vancouver Island Whale Watch. Uh, so we've we've got some great questions that have been coming in throughout the evening. Please do, folks, continue to put questions into the chat. This is your opportunity to have all your ORCA questions answered. Now, while we're organizing a few questions, I'm curious, do any of you have questions for each other? Yeah, Jenny. I think Giles was on a really important closing statement when she got the bolt. And I'm just curious if she would just read the rest of that slide before your funders to it, to us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Rose family or the Rose Foundation uh, this this year, just phenomenal um, uh, support. And then the um, Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, phenomenal support for the last two years. And then we have had the center, our own Center for Conservation Biology has, has uh, contributed, as well as this Washington Sea Grant, National Fish and Wildlife Federation, NOAA themselves, and the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Group. Um, it really came, came through in a pinch for us when we really needed funding a couple of years ago. So thanks for, thanks for asking for those names, Jenny. Yeah, and if you would back up and read the slide just before it, we, uh, you got cut out on your closing comments. And it was like oh. your, it was your home run that um, I, I really would love folks to hear that. Speakers um, yeah. are working together to get through their talks. <laughs> <laughs> We're cheetahs. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, the, ultimately, I guess you guys probably can't see my slide anymore, but um, it was a fabulous picture taken by uh, a well watch captain named Jim Maya. And it looks like it's a mother and, and offspring snuggling, but it's actually two brothers, J27 uh, Blackberry and J39 Mako, um, a couple of years after their mom died. And uh, they're just fabulous brothers. The whole family is incredible. And um, the slide was talking about something that another researcher, Alexandra Morton, said about if we lose this population of whales, the Southern residents, it's the first time in history in which we lose a population uh, where every individual is known. Mm -hmm. And when I heard her say that, it really was like a, 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 a gut yeah. blow um, because it is true. We, we folks that get to study these animals know them as individuals and, um, and certainly they themselves know each other as individuals and as family members. And so uh, everything that's impacting them is basically our fault and we have it in our will. We have, uh, pardon me, we have it in our capacity to change it. We just need to find the will to do it. Yeah, it's such a, a powerful object lesson of the power of, of names and understanding individuals and seeing animals as individuals, because sometimes we think about, you know, entire species and we worry about entire species uh, that may that may go extinct. But it, those species and populations are made up of distinct individuals, and each one of those individuals has a story to tell. So that's really important. So we've gotten a couple of questions come in, and um, some of them are really curious about sort of where we find different populations of orcas. So uh, for example, the Southern residents. Um, so Jenny, where, where are the Southern residents around this time of year? So around this time of year, we should be seeing them in the inland waters, but because we don't have the returning fish. So, so Southern residents, I, I mentioned their range is from Southeast Alaska to, to California. And what they're doing is following returning fish runs. So if you think about where the salmon streams are, the Fraser River is a big one here, but also the Columbia, the Sacramento, the Russian, all the way up and down, they know the times of those runs. So what they're gonna do is cruise up and down the coast throughout the inland waters, looking for fish. And if they pop in here and they're not at the Fraser, they've gotta go somewhere else. Uh, we've been really encouraged to see some early return turns on the Elwha. Uh, we think they're probably picking up some there, but any more, they're spending a lot more time um, out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the outer coast because um, they're finding fish. Um, so there, there's a, a First Nations indigenous saying that, you know, when the waters return and cool off in the streams, the salmon can come home. So climate change is not something yeah. that we talked about tonight, but it's a big deal because as the streams, you know, we talked about stream restoration, as the streams are too hot for the salmon to return and spawn the fish that dies for love, um, the orcas are not going to follow them in. Um, but as soon as the salmon turn and start to come in, you'll see the orcas right behind them. The southern residents, I should be specific. 
Yeah, and we talked a little. We talked about Southern residents. We talked about uh, the bigs, and you also mentioned Jenny. Also mentioned the the uh, the offshore orcas. Natalie, when you're doing your trips, do you ever see the offshore orcas? Uh, no, we haven't before. I've heard they've come in um, once or twice before, but it'd be pretty rare to see them on the inside here. Um, so we're watching the bigs orca, the ones that are hunting for seals and sea lions and porpoises and dolphins. So yeah, those are the ones. So we had a viewer who has either spent some time in Oregon or is from Oregon, and they are curious about when or if they could see orcas off of the Oregon coast. I imagine they could. It's part of their range, I think, but I'm not sure if there's any whale watching companies down there. So you might have to get lucky from shore or from one of your own recreational boats. <laughs> Yeah, I know that they have, they certainly have whale watching trips, but they focus more on um, some of the baleen whales that live okay. off of those coasts um, and not, not necessarily on orcas, but it's, uh, it's, but we know that since they range all the way down to California, there must be at least a, at least a shot. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to pull another question out of here. Um, oh, well, one came in, I, I, I've, I've got a, I know I, we picked it out. Um, we had a young viewer, Giles, is really curious. Um, what does whale poop smell like? <laughs> um, well, I can tell you that the grossest was that this um, humpback whale that we collected a massive sample from. I mean, it was like you saw the, 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 the tubes that I had and the teeny tiny speck at the bottom is about a, a mil and a half. Um, we had 10 full vials and we stopped at 10 <laughs> from this humpback whale. It looked like a berry smoothie, but the smell, <laughs> I can't even describe to you what the smell was. It was disgusting. Um, I can now tell you that the, the at least this one, that, that hairy one that I was with Noah in 2010, I don't remember it having a smell at all. Um, this one that we just collected yesterday, it was actually really interesting. There was no smell on the water, um, but when we got it home and spun it down again on the, a, a, a higher powered centrifuge um, and poured off the water, it smelled, uh, my husband said it smelled like really deep, rich earth, actually. It was not a bad smell. Um, mm. And that one had some fat globs in it. It had some hair, maybe even some blood um, and a big kind of fatty, white thing in this tiny little, you know, thing that was about that big, all of that. And uh, uh, so and enough of a smell for sure for Eva to be able to learn that smell and then be able to find that, uh, find that for us, hopefully later. Yeah. Who knew you, you in, did you ever think you'd become quite such a connoisseur? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. How long does it take to train Eva? Uh, it took us, uh, Eva was a very fast study actually for Southern residents. We were uh, pleasantly surprised. She trained for about five days on land. Uh, and then she, on her second day with wild whales, she found her first poop for us by yeah. herself. Yeah. So here's a question maybe for Aaron and, and maybe Natalie might want to jump in too. There was a, someone noted that they had read about electric powered whale watching boats in Iceland and remarking that they were very quiet. Um, Aaron, have you, have you all experienced any electric boats? Have you noticed a difference? Is that, is that something that you all have thought about at all? Yeah, um, I know that there's a lot of research and development going on right now um, into electric vessels, and I certainly think that that is is a a worthy worthy pursuit um, because um, the the sum total of all the noise from we may think that it's just one boat, but the the reality is there are a lot of people out there enjoying the ocean, which is fantastic, but it does contribute to a loud soundscape. Natalie, is there any move towards electric boats? Have you all thought about that in your move towards creating the most sustainable whale watching company on earth? Yeah, I think uh, definitely it would be an ultimate goal to get there one day. Right now, it's uh, I think it's pretty new and um, definitely would uh, we have quite a big range of where we can go. So we cover anywhere from Vancouver down to the Victoria area and north and we travel pretty fast. So that can be um, really tricky with the electric engines and to try and get enough power for that. Um, but definitely keeping our eyes on it and seeing what's developed and stuff. 
Jasmine, you talked about um, you know that that study on the stormwater runoff. It's just so impactful. I mean, everybody, you know, as soon as that came out, people were talking about it. It was just such a buzz throughout the the community here in the Pacific Northwest. What's the next stage of that research? You talked a little bit about the the non lethal levels or, or less than lethal levels, but what's what's next for that research direction? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I think the next step is determining whether or not other species of, of uh, Pacific salmon are reacting to the same chemical we've identified that coho are reacting to. Um, as you can imagine, stormwater runoff uh, picks up everything that's on the road and there's thousands of chemicals that wind up um, becoming a chemical mixture mm -hmm. every time it rains. Um, so we were able to identify for coho that what's really the issue is um, is a chemical associated with tires, but we haven't confirmed if it's um, the same chemical in other species, even though we know that stormwater in general is already an issue. Um, I think in terms of what people can do, um, since we already know that stormwater is an issue and we already know that there are simple solutions um, to filter out those chemicals, is to uh, really advocate for increased stormwater management um, and green stormwater infrastructure um, in our cities and in developing areas um, as an option for cleaning up our waters. So I have a, I have a question from uh, Christy Boone and her eight-year-old has a very, very pressing question for anybody who'd like to answer it. What what was it about orcas that made you decide to study them? What makes you love an orca? Mm -hmm. Who wants to jump on that? Jenny, do you want to start? I'm happy to start. So Christy, I am not a scientist. I am a person who knows how to manage organizations. So I run the museum. Um, I'm a part-time photographer. And when I first saw them, I was so awestruck by their power, but yet their fragility, by their dynamic presence, and then their mysterious disappearance when they would go beneath the surface of the water. It was always a moment of magic and wonder to sit and watch the whales or the flat sea surface and wonder if I would see a whale. Um, also watching them and how much uh, they care for their family members, particularly in the Southern resident community, have tactile, they touch each other all the time, they communicate with one another, they share. Um, it's the kind of family I would love to be a part of. Um, so I started to study them and really focus on them. Yeah, I would say the same. It's uh, the family bonds for me, like watching them interact with their moms and their aunts and see kind of the big brothers swimming off to the side and how they interact with each other. And then just how emotionally, emotional capable they are. And uh, yeah, bonding with each other and joining up for different feeding sessions and then starting to watch the big orcas and how they have all their different hunting strategies and um, being the apex predator is really impressive and, and fun to watch. Anyone else have a, have a yeah. one to weigh in? I can jump in. I, I mostly study um, fish, but I can say in terms of orca, I'm just, I'm so impressed by um, how intelligent they are and at the same time how little we understand about their intelligence and about them and i think it's so interesting that they have different dialects um mm -hmm. depending on you know what family they belong to just like we do um and so i think there's just so much more to learn about um them and their their culture and their um intelligence as a species I don't, I don't, uh, it's, it's really hard to articulate what, why I initially fell in love with them. I, I was, I was a young person, probably around eight. Uh, actually, I think I was about six. Um, so they've always been in my consciousness. Um, I got to see them in the wild for the first time when I was 18 on my 18th birthday from the west side of San Juan Island at the San Juan County Park. And uh, from that moment on, I, I was just hooked and I knew I would go to work for them in some capacity at some point in my life. Um, since I've started to um, get to work with them and study them since 2005, uh, the thing that resonates with me is it's really interesting. It's, it's essentially what all so, uh, people have said so far, 
um, it's their their social bond, their social bonds themselves. Um, they, to me, uh, I, I say that they are a better version of us. They give us something to aspire to. Their um, deep connections with one another, the the fact that they will forage and uh, share food with with their family members, even though they're starving. Uh, those sorts of things. They, you know, they carry their deceased and care for their sick. All of these things really are uh, indicators to me of, of family and, and what family should be and, and uh, what we as a human family should be striving for. Uh, I would echo a lot of what everyone has already said. They are um, giant predators in the ocean. Um, so they're, they're fascinating. I as well um, first saw them in the wild at a, at a young age and decided to get involved with science and research because at the time that I was um, beginning my scientific career it was around the time that killer, the Southern resident orcas had um, suffered a huge population decline. And I wanted to use science to help, um, help recover the population. That was a long time ago. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, as we've talked about before, um, they are critically endangered. And I think um, we really need to use this time wisely uh, to, to save the individuals that are left and to support recovery of the population. Yeah, you know, uh, what I love about these lightning talks and and, and what all of you do is it, it helps people see that there are many pathways into finding ways to to help with something that they're passionate about. I mean, you we have we have a number of scientists here. We have someone who's working to connect people. Uh, we have someone operating a museum. I know Jasmine, you also have some experience with policy work as well. There's so many different entries, and you all have clearly inspired people. And there's a question about volunteer opportunities. Yeah. And of course, I'll shamelessly plug the aquarium. We all we also have volunteer opportunities. But how? What what opportunities with any of y'all's work do you have for people to get involved? Yeah, Jenny, start. Oh, I'm happy to. The whale museum is fueled by volunteers. Uh, so if you are ever on San Juan Island and want to help us do anything from administrative stuff like labeling newsletters to uh, docenting at the museum, helping guide programs, and even doing things that are more like conservation research, which is monitoring our hydrophone or even volunteering for our stranding network or the Soundwatch Boater Education Program. Uh, depending on how much time you give, uh, we've got an opportunity for you. Thanks. Um, I started off uh, not in Seattle, but in Vancouver at the aquarium there. So they have a really great wet labs program where you get to learn all about the intertidal zone and the different animals that you can find. And then it's an education program. So you're talking to a lot of people and um, you always learn a bit more when you have to talk about it to a bunch of people. So you're, it really gets ingrained in you and seeing all the different things happen in, in the wet lab there. Um, there's also a sightings network there where you can enter your whale sightings and help out a bunch of different um, organizations throughout the whole coast here who want to see or hear about where different whales are seen. Um, so you can do that from your home by just submitting the sighting online. Uh, and then uh, with Vancouver Island Whale Watch here, uh, we're also affiliated with Kita Coastal Conservation. Uh, and they're a humpback whale research uh, group up here. So if you get any humpback sightings, you can submit them to us and we have um, all ways to get involved for volunteering as well. And, and Aaron, I know you all, the Oceans Initiative has a lot of outreach programming. I know you all offered a great summer camp during the pandemic for kids to, that they could do from their couch. What other outreach uh, work do you all have planned? Well, one of our, I was going to say, one, I think it's a great start to start at the aquarium or the whale museum. I think it's also fantastic for people to think about their own contribution. What are your unique gifts and talents that you can bring to ocean conservation? If, you're, if that's something you're passionate about, you can write, you can take photographs, you can organize beach cleanups. So, so many things you can do without an official volunteer position. Um, and I'm not sure what we'll be offering going forward, but um, one of our core values at Oceans Initiative is to um, try and pay our research assistants um, because if, there's a lot of inequity in um, marine mammal science in particular. And so we're doing our best to, as a small nonprofit um, to to try and and hire people and pay them for their their expertise. But we love 
um, any contribution people can make in terms of um, amplifying our, our message and, and, and sharing the work that we do. Thank you, Aaron. So um, I'm curious if you all, so you all shared a lot of stuff that people could do uh, to help orcas. Uh, Jenny gave us a whole list of, of things. If each of you were going to give us one action for people to go to help orcas mm. tomorrow or this summer, what would you recommend? Just one? Well, they can do many, but I'm I'm asking for for one from each of you. All right, I'm going to go last this time. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I would say a very general one: just talk about them and spread your love for them, and bring it up whenever you can uh, about ocean conservation in general, and just um, get people more people talking about their problems, but also encouraging them to go out and look for them from shore or a boat. Um, and yeah, just spreading the word. Yeah, and Natalie, thank you for saying that. I, I hope people don't underestimate the power of that particular action because ocean conservations are often out of sight and out of mind. The news cycle is very noisy uh, and there are lots of things for us to pay attention to and the ocean sometimes gets pushed to the side. So the more you talk about it with your community, with your friends, with your family, the more likely it is for it to stay stay closer to the front of mind. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, from, from my perspective, um, everything that everybody's already said is fantastic. Um, the, the opportunities for people to get educated, pass that information on to other people and get involved, get active, um, learn how to letter write, learn how to sit in on webinars from things like fisheries management meetings or dam removal meetings. Um, you know, really learn about the issues and take a stance. Um, I, I had just a fantastic experience today. I'm, I'm actually on the mainland today uh, for a doctor appointment. Um, and uh, I stopped by the, the Brown Lantern to, to get a veggie burger um, before this, this talk tonight. And the waitress um, noticed Eva and she said, is that Eva? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it is. And she's like, my son is obsessed with that dog. And he, he, she sent me this picture of her son that made this sign that says, remove the Lower Snake River Dam, save the salmon, save the whales. And he took it to Liz Lovelett, our representative in the 40th district. And she's there holding that sign with him. And uh, I was just, you know, you never know how your, you know, you, uh, you know how, how on earth did Eva <laughs> show up in the conversation tonight, uh, oh, this evening over my veggie burger, and then this came out of it. So, you know, it really does ma uh, matter. Every time we talk to people, we have the opportunity and the power to to educate them and to, and to empower them to educate more people. So I would strongly encourage people to go to our website, uh, wildorca.org. We have a, an incredibly uh, um, detailed list of, of things that are wrong with the Southern residents and ways that people can get involved. Uh, getting involved with fisheries management is a huge one, as well as uh, breaching dams that are not necessary anymore. And Jim, if I could just jump in, I know you've probably sure. got a closing question for us, but I want to echo everything everyone's saying is it's super important, but there's one that's not on any of our lists and it has um, gotten to our list this past year. We've had a really strange 15, 18 months with the pandemic and there's a lot of bad that happened this past year, but in terms of the planet, there was a lot of awesome that happened. We made a lot of room by, for nature just by staying home. So what I would ask people to do differently is don't be in a hurry to return back to the normal that we knew, but think about the way that you walked lighter this last year and how can you carry that forward and enjoy, enjoy our planet, give room to nature, um, because that really helps all of the critters and the whales. So if we make space for them by spending less time running around being normal, um, let's find what we can do to, to lighten our imprint uh, to make room for them. Yeah, I, I love that, Jenny, because uh, when we look back and say, go back to normal, normal wasn't working for a lot of us. It wasn't mm -hmm. working for a lot of people. It wasn't working for a lot of animals and systems. So whatever's next, I, I hope is better uh, than going back to normal. 
So we're close to the end of the hour, and I, I, there's one more question that came in that I that I really want to pose to and have a have at least a few of us answer. And I'm, I wonder if we could start with Jasmine. Um, we had a question about what what gives you hope. What gives you hope that there's a future for the Southern residents and 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 Puget Sound, and our relationship with with both the residents and our sound. Thanks, Jim. Um, I I could probably speak about this for a long time, so I'll try to keep it brief. But um, I really love um, opportunities to connect with, particularly with the youth, with the next generation. I feel like um, we're learning more and more about what we need to do to be different um, in the future and how we need to evolve as humans in order to um, coexist not only with orcas, but with, um, with the environment. And so any opportunity that I can um, be a mentor or even you know, learn from the youth about um, what their opinions are, I feel like gives me a lot of hope and um, humility about how much there is um, to learn. And um, so I, I definitely think opportunities like this, uh, working with people in the field from all walks of life that have the same um, goals and passions, um, but particularly the youth. Erin, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is that um, the Southern resident killer whales are among the best studied cetacean in the world. So we have the information right now to help them. We have the information available at our fingertips to support their recovery. And all we have to do is pick up the conservation tools and, and use them. Natalie? Uh, yeah, mine's kind of along the uh, lines of what Jasmine was saying. Um, I would go cyclic with like being very hopeful and then I'll get really sad about seeing a bunch of stuff, but I'm always brought up again by seeing how much other people are inspired and all the work that they're doing. And I just think there's so many people out there who are working for a better ocean. And um, as long as everyone's doing a little bit something, I think we can get there and push other people to do a little bit more. So that's, yeah, other people. <laughs> Yeah, I love that you that you mentioned the ups and the downs because you know we talk a lot about conservation optimism and conservation optimism isn't about being a Pollyanna. It's about understanding and learning to balance that that hope and despair because we need to feel the downs as well because mm -hmm. because of how much we care. Because if and if you stop feeling that, I mean, you, you can't find the path forward. Yeah, Giles, what gives you hope? Uh, the whales themselves give me hope. They're an incredibly resilient bunch of animals and uh, they care for each other. And they, uh, if given the, some space and given some, some food, uh, I have every reason to believe that this population will rebound. So uh, we, we humans need to take action as, as much and as often as possible to undo some of the damage that we've done and, and give them that opportunity to, to rebound and, and their resiliency as individuals and as a population gives me every reason to believe that that's possible. Jenny, give us one last thing to be hopeful about. Well, I have a lot of hope and um, it's been shared by my colleagues here tonight, but you know, as Giles said, you know, the first is the whales give me hope. Um, they're not giving up, so why should we? You've got Ocean's son, who was estimated to be born in 1928. Look at the amazing things that she survived and she's still out there leading her family. We have new three new calves in the past year. Uh, they, the, as researchers would tell you, almost always have a pregnant Southern resident killer whale. So that gives me hope. They're not giving up. I'm not gonna give up on them. You guys give me hope. We have over 8 million people that live in the, in the region that touches the waters of the Salish Sea. That's over 100,000 people per whale collectively, we can have an amazingly positive impact on this population. So I think all of you who joined us here tonight definitely wanna join all of us who are doing this work. So my colleagues and you as participants tonight, give me hope. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. I, I just, I love that last question. We just might make that Thank a you. tradition for lightning talks because <laughs> I, I think understanding, yes, it's serious. Uh, and that there's work to be done, but uh, having hope and resilience uh, and learning from the whales and their resilience and learning from nature and its resilience uh, should help make us resilient in this in this battle to 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 find a better relationship with with the ocean. 
Well, thank you all so much. Uh, that, like I said, that is all the time we have this evening. I, I, you know, from the comments that I've been watching come in, I know you all had a great time this evening. If we were all live and in person, I know that everybody would be raucously applauding uh, our speakers. And if you'd like to drop some applause emoji in the chat, I know that they would appreciate those as well. They were all fantastic this evening. If you enjoyed tonight's event, uh, please do consider a donation. This is how we keep programs like these happening, making them free and accessible for everybody. Uh, if you're local, please do come down and see us. Uh, we are still operating with some reduced capacity and that allows for physical distancing and, and a really safe experience. Uh, and you couple that together with the, with the plan ahead pricing we're using and time ticking. And it's it's a really pretty great experience. My, my I had my extended family in town this weekend celebrating my daughter's graduation. And I brought the whole crew in on the busiest day we've had in a year. And it was fantastic. We we saw everything we wanted to see. We never felt crowded. It's 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 a pretty it's a pretty nice experience. So I'd encourage everybody to come on down. Now, this is our last lightning talks for this, uh, I guess we could call it a season. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed all of our events on, on sharks, on orcas, on otters, and, uh, and on octopuses. So if you missed any of them live, you can revisit them on the YouTube channel or, or watch them again and again and again if you'd like. We will be back after the summer uh, in the fall with a new series. If you have any ideas for topics that you'd like to see in our next series of lightning talks, please do send them our, our way. You never know the next lightning talks you see may be your own. Uh, thank you so much for spending the evening with us and uh, have a great evening.